What's up? Welcome to episode two of Fully Remote, the only show for leaders who are remote first. Fully remote, 100% remote, going all in on remote. Super happy to have you here. Tonight's show, we're talking about remote hiring. This job market's insane. We've got some sweet poll questions, some Q&A and discussion time built in. I'm doubling down. I want to make today's show super interactive. Welcome, welcome, Bill. We're just getting started. We're going to talk about frustrations when it comes to remote hiring, things we found helpful in getting great talent, and things that are different between filling a remote role versus an in-person one, uh, and other out-of-the-box strategies that exist for getting the best talent. More on these topics today. We're going to go ahead and get warmed up here. Quick, quick warm-up. We don't do heavy warm-ups here. Let me know where you're joining us from. Just type it into your zinc box there. We'll do a word cloud reveal in just a little bit. Be as specific as you like. Or as vague as you like. But it's fun. And I think a nice little tradition that we have on this show to do a one word open. Show where everybody's coming from. Awesome. <laughs> I love that. In Bangalore, Denver, Silicon Valley, welcome, welcome everybody. That's truly a, an international crowd here on episode two. How cool is that? All right, I brought CEO of Zinc.ai, Arjun, to share some experiences and what he's learned about remote hiring. Uh, we've been talking a little bit before the show. Arjun's been the head of product, CTO, entrepreneur in residence, now a successful serial startup founder. You can uh, check him out on LinkedIn, on Twitter. On the right hand side of your screen there. Now, thanks for kicking us off our June, the job market. As I said, it's nuts. It's nuts right now. More and more companies are recruiting for fully remote roles. Uh, it's, hiring is just hard. It was hard to begin with, but uh, I want to know, um, you know some of your thoughts on uh, you know, what you've been trying recently uh, and you know what might be what may, what might be hard for fully remote organizations. Yeah, I mean, the talent market is pretty crazy, as you said. Like hiring in general is hard, and then remote is added like a new twist to this that's made it very different, and I would say hard in different ways. Um, I mean, first up, like when we've when this whole remote work boom like picked up, we realized that like okay, maybe this is what we were looking for. There's like a globally diverse workforce that we could tap into, uh, but then like quickly the other challenges came up. Like I would say like the the top frustration that like we faced on um, in the initial stages were around like all the legalities and the paperwork of like getting somebody remote on boarded, like being able to like, give them equity and everything. And that said, like since then, um, there are so many different companies that have come to ease this pain. Uh, they act as middlemen to or middle people to uh, solve for this problem and. Uh, so now I would say like the top frustration or like the top concern that I'm having at this point of time was, would be around how do you like, communicate or align on like the work culture that your company has and like how do you hire for that? And this is especially hard when you're talking about truly a geographically diverse workforce because uh, different countries, different work cultures, and now you're blending it with yours. And then added to it is that like not many people have still very much experience in like a fully remote company, which means that how much autonomy to give and like what kind of processes, asynchronous, synchronous, and all these things come up. How do you align for this? And that's been like our biggest frustration is in like, first of all, coming up with what works for us and then being able to hire for a good fit on that as well. So I'd say that still remains like uh, a frustration. Right on. And I want to hear uh, all of your frustrations. Uh, if you're on the show and, and in our audience today, we'll have a quick roundtable discussion a little, a little bit later. But I want to jump over to a quick poll question, which I always think is really interesting, which is, you know, when you think about hiring within your organization, maybe you've been part of the hiring loop. Maybe you are the hiring manager. Compared to pre-pandemic, is it harder or is it easier? So I'll give you a quick 20 seconds to think about this question and why that might be. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more. We'll, we'll take a look at the, um, we'll, we'll take a look at these results here. 
couple more seconds, folks. All right. So 38%, full 38%, way out in front in terms of uh, it being a lot harder to hire now close uh, compared to pre-pandemic. Like no one responded. It's it's easier in any way. It's either the same or it's a lot, uh, it's a lot or somewhat harder. Arjun, back to you. Uh, I want I want to know yeah, as as um, as a hiring manager yourself. I mean, um, you know, you can't speak for all organizations, but you know, how does this resonate with your experience? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of very obvious, right? Like, it's definitely not gotten easier. I would say it's gotten somewhat challenging in different ways, somewhat easier in other ways, but overall, net net, I would say is it's gotten harder, and I think um, I can. I can see that like almost everybody thinks the same. Awesome. And if you do have a question, folks, or if you have something to add, mash that raise hand button. Love to bring you on the stage. Onto a, this is a talk show after all. It, Arjun, when you think about, uh, uh, oh, Jay, I'm going to bring you on. What have you got? Oh, yeah, me with it. Yeah, I just, I mean, I, I, I was the one, I was one of the people who voted it was a lot harder. I just wanted to chime in as to why I thought one reason as to what I thought it was is that I, I find that pre pre pandemic hiring and post pandemic hiring, there's just a lot larger candidate pool to go through. It's, it's like you have, I mean, there are like really good can, uh, candidates out there, especially if you want to go fully, fully remote, like uh, uh, there are a lot there, but the problem is that there are a lot of people realizing that uh, software engineering can be done at different levels. And you know what? I could just, quit my job, get a, go to a coding camp, and now I'm a software developer, right? So now you have these resumes across the gamut and you got to like, see through that. And there's like an added like 50% effort to like narrow in on that candidate. And then you, you got to like figure out where you want to hone in on. And that's one thing that's gotten a lot harder. I mean, I just wanted to sort of mention that as that's kind of been one of the, getting to the top of the funnel has been, has, top of the funnel has gotten a lot, lot, lot larger. And, and that's been one primary challenge, I'd say. Absolutely. I think uh, someone put it uh, um, very astutely to me very recently, which is it's like cutting a diamond. Not only do you have to balance, hey, I'm, uh, I'm able to now access talent all over the world. Thank you, Jay, by the way. But uh, I'm also competing with organizations uh, around the world. So I encourage you folks to think about, uh, think about the way you are promoting your culture online especially because that's how candidates are going to discover you uh, are you adding social proof from real people within your organization use glassdoor uh, this is a really good trick i i learned in past organizations which is if you want better glassdoor reviews you gotta ask for them so once a quarter maybe even once a month if, it, if you're having trouble is let people know hey why does this help the company? Because you know that if someone is uh, looking at your organization or interviewing or considering interviewing at the organization, they're going to check places like that out. They're going to check out reviews of your organization, the culture, uh, the CEO potentially, and uh, if, if this is a type of place they want to be working. Uh, so you got to ask for those things. And once people do understand the why, hey, this helps us out. We get better talent. We get better teammates. We get more done. Uh, this company does better. Therefore, we all do better. They usually they usually do it because they understand, but not uh, that's not always obvious when uh, when it comes to uh, speaking to candidates. Arjun, I know you have an opinion when it comes to you know using social proof sites or you know promoting culture um, online. Uh, what's been your experience uh, uh, doing that? I know that you've had some things work for you. I know that you're trying out a lot of different strategies. Tell us about what you're doing. Yeah, um, I think I mean th th that strategy of like. Uh, you know, talking about your culture and like, pro like having a, it, in some sense, like a brand identity, a culture brand identity of yourself uh, online, it makes a ton of sense, especially as an early stage startup. Uh, it, it is a very important. And I am using like review sites like Glassdoor for like more mature startups. I think it's like a great way to um, hire, uh, I mean, like, you know, improve the quality of uh, um, candidates that you get. Some of the things that like we've been trying that actually has uh, worked for us is, um, uh, you know, fractional employees. This is something that uh, you would imagine that um, 
fractional CMOs and fractional CFOs were quite the trend in like a couple of years back. And like now the hottest trend is like fractional employees. We have somebody who comes in and works for five hours every other week doing DevOps for us or like somebody who runs QA for like 10 hours every other week. So that's a strategy that makes um, that started to make sense for us. And so when somebody asks like how many people work in your company, it's, it's very hard to answer because there's like 15 of us in our Slack. That doesn't mean that like all of them are full-time employees. So how do you um, uh, leverage that whole fraction employees? And like, the, the flip side of that is people are open to that. That actually gives them more uh, flexibility, which is, which is kind of my other strategy that I would say Jay and I have been like uh, building this as a flexibility is one of the um, superpowers that we can offer. Like, you know, everybody has now, uh, realize that like they want some types of flexibility in the in the in how they work and so if we are able to offer like you can work 30 hours a week if you have to um, that actually attracts people that who would not be able to go work at Amazon because they do not offer something like that so um, that's another strategy that's working for us um, to be honest like almost uh, many I mean many of our employees currently work for fewer than like 40 hours who we still consider as full-time and offer same some of the same uh, um, perks and benefits. Um, and then also we have like digital nomads in our, um, uh, among our employees uh, who are working out of places where they post amazing pictures and make us jealous. So that's, that's, that's been like pretty awesome as well. Um, another strategy that I would say is, uh, again, this, is, this might be true even in the non-remote world, is uh, uh, tapping into um, ex-founders uh, or uh, ex-early employees of startups. Um, with the startup boom, there's like so many startups. And the unfortunate part about startups is uh, many of them don't take off. And many of these founders have a very varied experience that now going and working in a corporate company with like a one role is like hard for them. And so trying to tap into that network is also another strategy that we are like trying out. Um, this is not remote specific, but it's been something that uh, uh, has worked well for early stage startups. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, folks, if you do have a, a strategy that you're trying out and it seems to be working, we'd love to hear about that. Uh, hit that raise hand button. Love to uh, bring you on the show, uh, pull you off mute and, and share uh, Arjun, you, uh, well, we give people time to think about that. I mean, this idea of fractional employees, that's, that's awesome. Um, how do we, how do, how does someone get started doing that? I mean, like, let's say I'm a team leader at a large tech company and I want to try this out. You know, how would you recommend even kind of broaching that topic with say HR or, you know, I, I want to try to get that flexibility without, uh, rather than just trying to find formulaic people who can work the solid 40 hours a week and just get that kind of cookie cutter employee. There's got to be value there that can be had, but how do I even start that process? Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, again, like the, the whole paperwork slash like legality part of it is the things that like, I am not the right person to be talking to, but at the same time, uh, when it comes to, uh, how you find such talent, um, I'd say that like, uh, right now, um, having a job description that clearly mentions that like you're looking for flexible workforce is like one way to like even look at serious candidates who are applying for a near full-time opportunity with like a little bit of flexibility. Uh, but at the same time, the, um, the freelance network of people is just available at plenty right now. I mean, like there are sites like Upwork, Fiverr uh, for um, many of this and like, you know, Dribble for designs on where you can actually find uh, talented people that would be willing to spend like small amount. And this is nothing very new. These people have existed and like it, it only has become uh, a, a way of life rather than um, something that you did for a side project kind of thing. It, it is now your, your, your whole employee base is like filled with like these people and you call them sort of core to you getting your work done. So, yeah. Awesome. I want to switch gears a little bit, folks. Uh, we're going to jump over to, you know, when you, okay, let's say you got someone who's interested in working your organization, you're speaking to them on zoom and you got to interview them. I want to talk about your favorite interview questions. And this is truly, um, uh, uh, interactive folks. Um, 
I'll, uh, Arjun, I might bring you on to, to kick us off. Uh, I have a few as well. But think about uh, the, your best in interview questions, because I know that sometimes you know, there you'll pick up one from someone and it's like, oh, I'm going to ask that on my next interview because it's so revealing and it uh, gives me a sense as to who um, this person um, is at work. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll kick it off, uh, folks. I, you know, one of the ones I've been using um, lately in my career is, hey, what do you think you're going to have to unlearn mm. to be successful here? And uh, I think the reason why that's really um, helpful is it gives me a sense as to, hey, what does this person know about this role? Have they been, uh, does, does it seem like they get it enough to say, hey, uh, compared to my previous experience, here's something I may have to either overcome or something new I may have to learn uh, or something that uh, I, I may have to, um, a, a routine or habit that I may have to unlearn to be successful here. But I'd love to hear your, your favorite interview questions, folks. Just hit that raise hand button on the right hand side of your screen. I'd love to hear the backstory and why these questions are so strong. Melissa, love your comment. Bill, I'm gonna bring you on stage. Welcome to the show. How's it going? So I'll, I'll tell you my uh, my most loved interview question. The one I think I get the most value out of, and it also works because I ask the same thing whether I'm hiring engineers, PMs, or SDMs. I, I do interviews pretty frequently for all three. And I ask them about what is the coolest thing that you've ever built. And so it does a couple things for me. For engineers, I can dive deep on what is that architecture, that design you built, and, and the areas of ownership that they own also help me calibrate what level are these. Are these the type of things an SDE2 would own, or these are the type of things that a senior or principal engineer would own. And when you're talking to managers about what are the coolest thing they built, how did they build that? Did they build that by growing teams, or did they build that by getting directly involved? And same thing with PMs. How did they work through engineers to build what they needed to be done? And how did they make sure they were making the right trade-offs for tech debt and, and building the right product and the timelines that they needed? So I don't know, to, to me, that is the one question that I think seeds the entire rest of the interview. And it also lets them define what cool is, which tells me a lot about what type of, of engineer, or manager, or PM they are as well. So that's one of my favorites. Right on. And uh, would you say that's uh, one that you would bring out in the early Day, uh, right. days of the loop or uh, or the the later stage no that i i do that in the later stages the, in the earlier stages they're more technical i do like a little bit of a coding a little bit of tech design and uh and that type of stuff that's more for like the behavioral situation will tell me about a time when rounds where i'm the hiring manager right on right on well thank you for sharing i love that um, and we'll we'll take that in our notes for today we'll send that out to everybody along, with, like, along with today's recording bill thanks for joining us Arjun, I'm going to bring you on. Yeah. Um, if somebody else has to go, um, my question was going to be what you see yourself in five years. No, I'm kidding. Uh, that's just a terrible question. Don't ask that. But uh, uh, I think the um, w one question that I see a, a lot of value uh, is in like, what what have you like uh, learned in the last year that you've, you've seen yourself grow? Uh, and... Uh, sort of associated with that is like, what is the best piece of feedback you have received? Uh, and how did you act on that? Um, just to understand whether, um, you know, that there is, how, how do they see growth and like, you know, the, the growth mindset part of it? Right on. And is that something, uh, who, who would you ask these of? I mean, is it always those, those types of folks? Um, I think this is applicable to everybody, right? Like, again, like I've, I've sort of uh, interviewed for, like, again, like a wide variety of engineering as well as non-engineering roles. And I feel like uh, the, this question is applicable. I mean, this is true for both, like, my, my previous companies where the, the a part of our culture has always been about, like, being better every day. And so, like, how do you, like, view yourself as, like, a, with the growth mindset and how do you uh, see yourself improving at least like 1% every day kind of mentality. Um, and so this gives me an opportunity to see how they look at feedback and how they're open to uh, improving as well as like how they're good about like giving other people feedback and like seeing other people grow as well. Right on. Love to hear from uh, Arjun and I'll hear from some other folks. If you do have those, hit that raise hand button. 
Jay, I'm going to bring you on stage. Welcome back. Thanks. Yeah, one of the things, uh, it gets a bit more specific, considering that like I, I mainly focus my time on like looking hiring engineers. And one of the things that's worked really well is for us to actually kind of take pieces of our stack and like make them into a nice sort of coding problem and post the, post that. Uh, and a nice side is you get free code. You know, you, you might actually get. Some, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean tongue in cheek, maybe a little bit. Yeah, we we actually had one of our hires kind of blew us away. He really built an awesome component, and like we that was like a, we wanted to get that person. And it turns out that he's one of those person people people who also loves flexibility, and we got quality and flexibility. So, but. The reason is that that's a piece of your software, you re, at least the requirements of which you understand really, really well. And, and you can completely assess the solution, both the technical depth and how they thought through. Did they, like, how long did it take for them to get through some of these things that you have thought about that piece of problem thinking for like, several months? And they only got like maybe a few hours to think about it. Did they get 50% of that? That means they're awesome, right? Like, they could think of so much in, like, in such short time, but that you probably spent thinking, spending days thinking about it. So uh, I find that pretty useful. Uh, and then they, it could be anything, right? Like it could be a design part where how would, how would you design the backend of your system? Or how would you pick this little feature? Or how would you do it? How do you implement race hand block, right? How do you do that? Like these kinds of things. I found them uh, really insightful. Awesome. I love that. And I, I think that's a really good uh, segue to our uh, next little segment here, which is a little bit of a, a little bit of Q&A. And uh, I know we did get some email questions as well. I know that uh, there've been some really good, good questions submitted um, and you, you all have been thinking about some good questions too. Um, Arjun, I'm just going to ask this on live. This comes from Gina. How does the process change if you're interviewing remotely versus in person? Yeah, I, and I think the, the the whole technical aspect of it like largely remains same. We've all been like remote, like doing remote interviews for a while now as well. But uh, what one thing that I would say is. Uh, uh, is a, a larger emphasis on like how you build trust and belonging uh, ahead of this. And this is a bit of a challenge. I mean, there is, I don't have like a good answer for what you do in your interview to do this. But uh, one thing that's crucial is that like you will be, I mean, like in my, my previous startup and we were all like in the same place, um, we were having lunch together and like the, the, the sense of belonging and trust that you built over time was just, uh, you know, uh, amazing, but uh, when it comes to remote, that's actually going to be one of the biggest challenges. It's probably worth a topic in itself, like building that trust and uh, belonging in a remote world. So now there's a big onus on like, how are you going to like interview somebody for that? So um, I, I feel like that I would say is uh, a big difference that's come up is like that emphasis on uh, figuring out whether you can trust this person. Right on. And yeah, I mean, building trust is it, it, it's hard over uh, over the, the, the airwaves, but uh, it really just, just boils down to building a relationship, right? Building a relationship with people and how do you do that? That's that's different when it comes to uh, building a relationship with uh, different individuals, different personality types, folks who may want that flexibility and, and shut off at, a, at the end of the day uh, or um, are willing to go the extra mile in certain cases. Ash, I'm gonna bring you on stage to uh, uh, ask ask a question. is off over here but we still can see ash's question unless it's a different question but um maybe, maybe I, can, bring him can up I, I can I, I can unmute you about that oh, um he should unmute himself ash you want to uh unmute yourself and uh there you are hey there welcome can you hear can you hear me now? Cool. Yeah. So <laughs> my question was for Arjun. So you made it sound like it was uh, it was totally not cool to ask the question where people see themselves in the future. And I was I was sort of just curious as to why, because I definitely have asked that question. <laughs> you, you asked that question? Yeah. I think it was cool to ask that question like some 10 years back where people gave all <laughs> bullshit answers and that they would be loyal to the company and all the crap. And like now, well, almost definitely my answer is that like, I'm probably not going to be working in this company in like five years if I were interviewed. So and it's like a question that is like almost pointless and it falls in the mm -hmm. that's kind of none of your business what I'm doing in five years kind of a mindset that people have for that. Um, and also 
five years is a long time and like given things how it's changing it's like really crazy if you can like predict what's going to happen next year leave alone five years and so um the value of that question is almost nothing for me uh, or the answer that i get it's a cool question you could ask it and like know more about that person but there's probably better things that you can ask about them to know more about them than like asking them for a, a future version of it absolutely or at least have they uh, yeah yeah i think that's fair uh, i mean i would just push back and say like i think it's really helpful to know where the person does want to go or where to see themselves even if it's without you i mean even if you just real realize that a job is a stepping stone for someone that's totally fine and like having that knowledge of, ahead of time is probably helpful whether or not they do stick with the company i think is like separate from like what their career goals and ambitions are so you can slot people into the right roles right i mean i think the the uh again this is the amount of like trust that you have built into like that interview process so far isn't saying that like if you are going to answer this question where you're not going to be part of my company then like you know if you're not going to hire me then my answer for that is going to be very, very nebulous. And I can say whatever I want because it's like five years into the future. So the va again, right, like it's a cool question and like, you know, it's like you can get cool answers, but like how much you want to value that answer is, I, I would say is like less. That's again, right, like uh, varies if you, if you know, if you have the kind of personality that like people uh, understand that like you're not going to reject them because of that answer, uh, then maybe it's a good question to ask, yeah. Right on. Uh, I'm going to spin this curveball to the group as well, which is um, I had a candidate one time tell me, hey, I'm going to give you right now my two years notice. What do you do in that situation? Um, can, you, can you repeat that question? Yeah, it's like, it, it, I guess it's not really a question, but it's like, hey, what would you do if someone said, hey, I, right here at the time I hire, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you my two years notice. Like I'm, I'm going to be here for two years and then I'm, I'm gone um, somewhere else unless something kind of crazy happens. Um, I, it, it feels to me like people are kind of saying this more and more. Uh, I, I'm curious as to the group's uh, response. You can answer your response in the questions yeah. here, folks. We'll, we'll look for those. But uh, I'd like to hear what you think of that one. I, I'd love to hear other people's opinion, but I, I personally would like appreciate that candor uh, for what they bring and like say that like that's great to know and uh, and I feel like the uh, the it's implicit these days that like two years is probably like what somebody would work. So I, I don't think it'd be like a jarring for me that like oh this person's gonna leave me in two years. Um, but it gives a good uh, mindset as to like, you know, what this person is expecting uh, out of this and that like for them, uh, what they would want to, I would position this question back to them to know what is it that you want to get out of this two years is probably where I would start focusing on and see uh, if you are talented and if you am bringing in and if we have two years, how can we set both of us for success? Right on. I see a question from Robert. Welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Robert asks, what are some strategies to help with building relationships in a remote world? Love this question. Uh, Arjun, what you, what you got? Um, yeah, I mean, this one, I want to actually like bring this back in the round table and I would love to hear opinions from everybody as well because this is something that like I am trying to learn uh, myself and I want to hear as many strategies as possible. But uh, some things that I've... I've uh, uh, I've seen being deployed very well is like, I mean, it starts with leaders and like building relationships is it, it starts with leaders displaying that sense of like trust and like setting a psychologically safe environment where people feel comfortable in like sharing and like, you know, building those relationships. Um, and I think that's one of the primary thing I would say. And like, again, leaders sh should display that level of vulnerability to uh, embrace the, uh, uh, you know, like em embrace the the fact that like it's uncomfortable to start, but like that's kind of how you form like good relationships over time. It's much more harder in the remote world. Like this is true nevertheless uh, for all teams, but it's much more harder in the remote world. And we've been thinking about this as well as like, how can you introduce processes and practices when people come together and a meeting or an face-to-face -face experience is your biggest opportunity to build serious trust and relationship. And so how can you make bring some uh, 
great frameworks and set the environment in such a way that it actually like um, helps people in getting trust. Uh, um, I mean, getting trust and building more meaningful relationships. Um, sure. Again, as as the founder of Zinc, like I think one of the things that we think about is that uh, good leaders and training them is uh, is actually something that is very important to build like meaningful relationship. But it's also a hard problem because you're talking about changing behaviors of people, but the environment is like the hidden force that guides behavior for people. So can you actually set in such a way that like an example could be that like in every meeting uh, at like the last five minute mark, it automatically pops up this surprise question that asks you to share one thing about how your weekend was. And then you just go around the table and you get like 90 seconds to talk about it. Uh, and again, it's like a, it's a, it's a thing that like no moderator has to like come up with that and enforce it. It's just built into your meeting solution and like it enables it. These are kind kind of things that can do it, and it's gonna. It feels like oh my god, that's five minutes wasted of my meeting. But uh, your replay. Think about like all the watercolor discussions. That's all. Right. Uh, you're replacing and building relationship. This is this is what you um, can do. Um, there are many software solutions as well that are coming up to solve for this uh, water cooler hallway conversations. Uh, I would definitely say we should try of the, try those and see which one works well for each company. Absolutely. Robert, yeah. I see that you got it's a hard. response there. I'm, I'm going to bring us well, over I'm to not... that round round table. But yeah, Robert, I would love to hear what you think. This is, this is the lean back chair right here. This is the lean back <laughs> screen. Uh, yeah, sorry for the uh, intrusion earlier with the the mic mute when stepson came running in. I was like, "Where's the mute button?" Um, <laughs> but no, I it, it's interesting, and it it's I think it is a, a leadership uh, kind of focused problem because all of that happened organically in the past. So, and then if you're trying to do a software solution, that's not necessarily organic either right it's like here and you put people on the spot and like i, I posed this question to some friends and, and colleagues here recently because i've been working from home most of my career so 25 years and so it, it's really to me this is no big deal and then for a lot of people this is now a big deal and so i'm, I'm trying to process well how did i do it for so long what how was i able to be successful and where was i unsuccessful and I think I think the relationship thing is the key um, moving forward. And I, it's uh, I think there's people that are getting missed that are getting left behind because they do really miss out on that water cooler, that um, those discussions. And it, it to me is it a introvert extrovert thing. Um, I'm an introvert, so this is okay with me. But if you're an extrovert, when I've heard from folks that that are they're like yeah this isn't so hot for me i'm kind of missing it and i i don't i wonder what the long-term solution is um and it almost seems to me that it's at some point uh you could be all remote and we can figure things out we get the right tools in place and we adopt the tools we can figure them correctly but i think there's still going to need to be like hey we meet in person once a month I almost think you can't really get around that if you're, if the employees you've hired are folks that really kind of crave that and want that. And I, I think we've got to, we've got to really watch out for that. And I don't which know. Which might boil really. down to, which might boil down to, it, it kind of depends on what those employees need. Love that. Mm. Love that. And thanks for sharing as well. We did get one more question via email folks before this, which is on applicants. And what do I do to get more applicants? It just feels like we're not getting any qualified people to literally apply to our JDs. Maybe we post on Indeed. I assume uh, they, they post in a variety of different places. I'm curious if this group has some some cool things to try uh, aside from run of the mill. Hey, maybe I go spend some money on LinkedIn or maybe I go spend on Indeed and get my job postings higher up. What have you done to uh, ensure great applicants in the door and feel free to unmute folks melissa uh i haven't heard from you love to get your opinion on this one i don't have a whole lot to share 
Right on. I do think folks, this just comes back to, um, you know, how well you promote your culture online and, um, employer branding, if you will, it's becoming a, a, a hotter term these days. But, uh, when we think about brand as one's reputation, it's, Hey, what is your reputation online? Uh, are you, are you known for either, uh, you know, having some cultural values that other people can align with? Have you published, uh, the way you get things done so that others can say, Hey, I like the way that company's, um, doing this. Are you moving quickly with social proof? Are you, this brings up things like Glassdoor and putting real employee examples. And if your employee experience is, uh, uh, is superior, then, um, is it good enough that employees will authentically share that online? Again, you're competing with people literally all over the world. And I see our, uh, action items and ideas, uh, lighting up there. Love to love to hear some of these. Um, Bill, I, I love this idea of a stand down meeting. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about what you mean? Yeah. So this is, you know, everybody's got the stand ups. That's kind of part of the normal sprint ceremony that every, everybody does. But at the beginning of the pandemic, I introduced a stand down meeting. One of the problems we were seeing was that people didn't know when to quit, right? They would keep working, work day would <laughs> yeah. go long into the night. So the stand down was a time for us to kind of replace that water cooler. We didn't have agenda. We don't really talk about, hey, here's what I'm working on. It was just to talk about things we've encountered during the day. What movies are we watching? What are we doing for the evening? Just mm -hmm. a chance for the team to connect. And it's actually, you know, it's completely optional. Some of the more introverted people show up once in a while. But for the most part, most of the team attends on a pretty regular basis. You know, we all keep our cameras on. We all chat. And it's been pretty good. I follow that up by making sure that after the meeting is over, I don't send email to the team. I'm never asking questions after five o'clock. Make right. sure I defer all those communications to the next day. But it's been pretty effective, I think. And it's I've seen teams that haven't instituted that around us. Like we've been really prone to attrition in my organization, but within my team, it stayed pretty strong. And I think a lot of that is because why we're seeing a lot of this like great resignation is because people don't feel that connection. They don't feel Maybe loyalty to the company is the wrong word, but people definitely had loyalty to each other, and that has definitely decreased. But I think this is a way to kind of get that back. People really are are there to see their friends and have that camaraderie back. So I think it's definitely helped. I, just I love, love that, that idea. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a good idea. And I think, and, this and not even team. saying, oh, I'm sorry. Well, please, please, Robert. Well, no, I love that. It's during that time. I'm not checking on status of stuff, right? That would be a that would be a very uh, <laughs> hard thing to hold back for. I think some people is like, well, well, yeah. How did that thing go? Did you figure that out? And like, if it's yeah. a standing, this is our time. We're done. Like, I I love that. Right on. And I think this is a great segue. And you know, right after I think this segment, we'll 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 start wrapping today's shows up, uh, show up, which is this idea of team culture and you know what what keeps people there at your organization uh and bill i love this idea because it brings in this notion of rituals rituals that are practices that um if you are in a fully remote organization what is different about running it that way versus say you know a quick stand up um at the white bar if you're uh, in an office or uh, if you're taking an all hands meeting there there can be a lot of really energizing activities that can occur in one of those but i i know that there within this room there's a lot going on that um uh, can 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 be beneficial uh, in a remote setting. I'd love to hear some of those. I know Arjun, you've done a cool couple of cool things. Ash, you've done a cool, couple of cool things. Robert, sounds like you've been doing this a while. I'd love to hear about some of those rituals that, hey, with enough consistency, this healthy habit is one of those things that people stay for. Yeah, I, a lot of it's individual ritual for me, uh, but I, I think what Bill was kind of referring to is more like, even though it wasn't business related, it's still like structured. And I, I think, I think the companies that maybe have really been challenged by this change and I've seen it with many different companies over the years, the ones that aren't necessarily really successful to begin with, they, they didn't have any good like project management strategies or, it was really just kind of like, oh, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing that. And I, I think I always say, let's have a methodology to, to handle anything. It doesn't need to be a big 
giant process, but just having methodologies like this, this, we get these issues in, we assign them, we put them on somewhere where we can see it, a nice tool is configured and set up and, and have that structure in place. Um, I think, I think is the other key for any organization, but I, I think a lot of people really just kind of fly by the seat of the pants <laughs> before. And then if you go in, all of a sudden everyone's remote, you don't, that, that leader or that manager can't go and like knock on that door and say, what's the status of this? So what's the status of that? And like they, they haven't enjoyed the, the pandemic so much. Right. So I think, I think you have that leadership and the structure and tools in place kind of guides, guides that. Um, otherwise you're, you're kind of floundering about. Right. Um, I love that. Yeah. One, one ritual that comes to mind is uh, what we call is the mood meter um, that we do. It's kind of similar to what uh, Bill mentioned is where uh, as a, either we do this as a part of our Friday or like a, a week sprint retrospective where we do this whiteboard um, where you go and like reflect upon this week and like mark how your mood was over this week on a scale of one to 10. It's almost mm -hmm. as if like you're drawing like a, a graph thing like I was a seven on Wednesday but then like I had to um my daughter's uh uh office I mean it's not daughter office my daughter's uh, uh daycare closed and so I actually was a three because I had to take care of her and then like this is not just and then like on Thursday I got a lot of work done so I picked up to like a nine and so you're talking not just about work but about your personal life it lets you to see who you are as a person number one number two it also means that like now I have empathy about like oh, I understand like why that Wednesday sucked for you. Um, this was what was going on. And so, um, and then you get this like nice graph of like, you know, where you are and like how your team looked over time. Um, and uh, we've, we have like a digital version of it that we do right now, but we, did, we used to do this on like whiteboard and markers uh, when we were back in San Francisco. I like that. Quick I'm writing pulse. down both y'all's ideas. <laughs> a quick pulse. On, uh, on on how people are doing. And I think this does come back to vulnerability, which I think we, we touched on a little bit uh, earlier, folks. And perhaps this will be a, a nice little closer, which is that uh, um, it's not, I mean, if you actually look up the word vulnerability, you're going to get all kinds of stuff about like being uh, like uh, prone to attack and in a weakened state and all that kind of stuff. I was like, well, no wonder no, uh, leaders don't want to be vulnerable because uh, because of how we define this word. But uh, when we do share a little bit about our personal lives, when we do share about something that might be a struggle for us, or when I don't know, uh, it's not so much that you're sharing that um, that you're not perfect, but it allows your employees, it allows your team member to know that it's okay to also share this stuff too, so that you can may help that person. If someone's a two out of five this week, you're probably not going to go in guns blazing, blazing, asking about, hey, what status, status, status. You're going to say, hey, what's going on so we can uh, help you. But if that person's a five out of five, I can take more. Then that's a different conversation entirely. Feedback, folks. If you do have that feedback on today's episode, we read every single piece. Just click that button in the lower left-hand side of your screen. Love to know what you think. Your ideas for future episodes of Fully Remote. We've got great guests, programs, and uh, topics coming up we do this every week on wednesdays let me know uh too if the time works as well you can play with that i'd love to make this at a convenient time for uh you and your colleagues so that we can all learn and share uh, and grow together for any last thoughts love to hear those we'll stick around but uh, until next time we'll see you next time thanks Thank all you for guys. being here thanks Thank thanks you. good to see you great to see you as well thanks. And I know where the mute button is now. <laughs>